what's going on this morning? You all brought the fire today. I know what it is. It's December 31st. December. I did that at the first service. What is the problem with me this morning? What is it? October 31st. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's right. It is Reformation Day, which I'm sure is what you all were thinking. This is the day that Martin Luther actually went in, uh, in 1517 and nailed his 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg church door. Uh, and we're going to talk about this morning um, the legacy that not just he, but long before him, the Apostle Paul, Silas, uh, and those who ended up going to prison uh, for what they believed, what the legacy that they have left us. We'll be in Acts 16 if you have an app. Uh, Bible, a good old leather-bound Bible, get it open. Uh, and I promise to preach as though it's October and not December. Um, we, we, I, a couple of, of quick things. I want, Chris Hecker will come up here a little bit later during announcement time and let you know the details on it, but I want to put a bug in your ear real quickly, especially for those of you online. Uh, I want to let you know that we are going to, to, to we, we've been looking for a way to bless some families this Thanksgiving. Opportunities presented itself. We're going to partner with Thrivent and a, and, a, and a local charity here in Escondido called A Step Beyond uh, to feed 150 families. Yeah, amen, amen. So would you, t- would you join me today in kind of leading up to that? We got, we got some groceries to buy, church. Uh, so we're going we're gonna to go out and our jobs decide, okay? So uh, we're going to go uh, shopping. We need a bunch of sides, all right? And so if you can do, help 10 families, do it. If you can help 20, do it or whatever. We just need you to sign up, okay? Uh, we've, got a, we've got a couple of weeks after this to do it and to get it all here. So we're going to do that. I want to invite you to join us, okay? Chris will have the details. So bookmark there, plus Reformation Day, plus now, yes, it's Halloween. So if you see somebody walking around the building that's dressed like a, uh, they have an axe sticking out of their head or something like that, <laughs> that's not our normal, our normal church, um, or it is our normal church just dressed in costume today. And uh, as you go about your business, there's going to be uh, always the debate that pops up, which is, what is the scariest movie ever made? To me, they break into two camps. One is the chase movies, where there's something chasing somebody. They they might have a chainsaw. They might have a meat cleaver. They might have something, or or they just maybe, I don't know, they they look crazy. So they're chasing people, and they're going through the woods and everything, and it seems like no matter where they land and you think they're safe, then they have to get up and keep moving again. And then there are like the whole other genre of like demon possession movies, which just as a, as a, as a preacher, that's, you know, they just, they weird you out and you kind of think, hey, should we be making movies like this at all or whatever? And it's funny because uh, when you look at Acts 16, it's both of those. You have a chase and you got demon possession. And I kind of keep thinking to myself, I'm like, well, um, I know how this one ends just because I've read it several times, but I don't want to get lost in the fact that if you were alive at the time, this would have been a terrifying experience. I mean, when Paul wakes up that morning, I doubt he thinks he's going to jail. He wakes up probably thinking he's going to go do Paul-like things. I'm going to go preach somewhere. Um, I'm going to get up and I'm going to go out. I'm going to go look for somebody to witness to. But he ends up in jail. So I want us to talk about how he got there, and then we'll read the story of when he's in jail together. So he and Silas, they've come to Philippi. They want to share the message of Jesus, and there happens to be a slave girl. She's owned by people, and she has a shtick that she does. She's a fortune teller. So you go up to her, and you're willing to pay. She will tell you your fortune. So it says that there's a spirit in her. It's kind of a creepy way to put it. It's what the Bible says, though. And so what happens is she can see the future, and she kind of seems to know things in some sort of creepy, weird way. So what ends up happening is when Paul and Silas go around, she starts trailing them and kind of hissing at them. She'll say, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. And she keeps saying this from behind them, and she does it day after day. It says for several days. And then it seems like, according to the text, It literally says, Paul gets annoyed with her. (laughs) I guess it's annoying when you have a demon-possessed girl and you're, you know, straggling behind you, hissing, you're, you know, pointing out things like that. I think probably the root of why he's upset is that he doesn't want people to think she's with them, but he gets annoyed, and so he turns around and he commands the evil spirit to come out of her. 
And it does, which is thrilling to the girl, and it's thrilling to Paul and Silas. It is not thrilling to her slaveholders, who now have lost their gravy train. They get mad, as many people do. People who are committed or benefit from oppression hate people who set people free. So they go and they grab, I mean, even now, you might have become a Christian recently and you realize, you know what, my family doesn't like me anymore. You know what, uh, my, my, my boss doesn't like me anymore or whatever, right? Because it's some, something happened, there was some relationship, something that went on that they benefited from as long as you were held captive to your sin, as long as you were on the other side. And in fact, you'll realize the devil himself really doesn't like recently liberated people. Back to the story. Her owners are so upset that they grab Paul, they grab Silas, they take him, and it says that they beat them. Uh, they drag them before the rulers of the colony. It says Paul and Silas beaten with rods by the magistrates. I guess back then, uh, or at least in this corner of the world, uh, the magistrates themselves would do the beating. That's kind of interesting. And then they're thrown into prison. So Paul has, <clears throat> so far, just going through Acts, okay? We're not even getting out into other books. Just Acts, okay? He's been uh, blinded, stoned half to death, beaten with rods, thrown into prison in a very short amount of time, just chronologically. Now he finds himself in a Roman prison with Silas. They're in stocks. Roman prisons were built uh, in such a way that you did not want to go there. We'll just say at the bottom of the list of priorities uh, in Rome was prisoners' rights. Those were not high on the list. They were not building a comfortable place. They were building a place that nobody wanted to go, and the very mention of that place would make people fall in a line. They were a law and order society, we'll say. And so Paul and Silas find themselves in there. They're in stocks. Those are those like handcuff-like things that go around your ankles and your arms. Okay, Roman prisons, they'd beat you to a bloody pulp. They would not change your clothes. Whatever you showed up in is what you were leaving in. Created all sorts of sanitation problems and a bunch of other things. They were miserable. They were brutally cold and brutally hot because there was no AC or anything like that. Um, and they were places of utter abject misery. So there they are. For just helping this girl be set free. God just going to let them sit there? How, if there's a God, why would they end up in prison? These are the kinds of questions we would ask. But it doesn't seem like they ask them at all. Their questions are not questions at all. They seem to do something really uh, odd. They sing and pray in jail. They sing and they pray. They sing and they pray. And in fact, it says they do it until midnight. It's as they are praying and praising that the great earthquake comes. It's often the spiritual practices of the church that actually sustain us when we're in whatever kind of prison we're in, inner prison, outer prison, whatever it may be. There's a lesson for us who find ourselves in the midst of life's troubles in part for doing good. Okay? This is not like uh, we went off and did something wrong and you're getting punished for it. This is when you do right when you're doing the right thing and you end up being punished for it, we often have this kind of disillusioned way of looking at the world in part because our emotions in the world we're living in, are, they run point. They are dictators in our lives. We interpret everything through that kind of experience rather than looking at things that we believe to be true, which is that God is. We also believe he's good and we believe that he's with us wherever we go and allowing that to shape the reality around us. So they sing and pray. What were they singing and praying about? I'm sure praying maybe for deliverance, maybe that God would give them peace, maybe that God would help them find a way to witness to the other prisoners in jail. But the praising part, we don't know for sure, but that is a way that people have expressed themselves for a very, very long time. In, you know, it goes back to the song of Moses or whatever. You've got people singing very, very long ago. The Psalms, of course, is probably where I think they got at least some of their songs from. It's like what we were doing earlier. That is a way in which God's people set truth to music. Okay, that's what worship does. It allows us to say what we believe to be true musically. 
and it helps us remember things, right? I can ask you right now uh, what uh, Habakkuk 1.6 says. Uh, you can probably not tell me. However, if I asked you to sing me a verse or two from an obscure Rolling Stones song back in the 70s, you might be able to do it. Um, some of you learned your alphabet not with mom or dad saying to you, hey, okay, it goes like this, all right, A, B, C, D. Remember that? No, they would sing it to you, right? they give you a little song to remember it to. In children's ministry, we often teach with songs. One of the reasons why singing matters as much as it does, it's not just that it takes a unique way of saying truth to God, it's that what we say out loud ends up being embossed on our memory much more clearly, right? So that, those choruses of those songs that we just sang, some of you, how did you even know what to sing? Well, you've sung them before. Well, how did you remember them? Well, you remember them because they're music. Paul and Silas are singing. Maybe they were the historical psalms, the ones where God, they just recount the great and mighty acts of God. Maybe they were the lament psalms, you know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22. Or maybe it was um, the wisdom psalms. Or maybe it was the imprecatory, the big fancy word for vengeance psalms. God, how long is it going to take you to destroy my enemies? Now, they're not, dis they're not prescriptive for us. They're more descriptive of how David felt. I'm on the run. Something's always chasing me. But they were singing all the same. Not the kind of weapons we would use today, and we would probably file a lawsuit. They use song. They use prayer. I'm just wondering if there's a lesson for us today. That in such times, in times where we find ourselves in the heat of the moment or um, looking at something that might on the surface be very uh, turbulent for us or something that feels oppressive to us or whatever, that, that what's about to happen, you're about to witness the hand of God break through in a mighty way. And once again, the Bible will teach us that God is working no matter where we may find ourselves, even if we find ourselves in jail. So don't misunderstand me and everything else I'm going to say here. It, I'm not saying everything else I'm saying. I'm not saying everything unpleasant you go through or anybody goes through is directly the hand of God. But Christians believe that whether they're in the penthouse or the prison, that God is working, that God is still there, and that while we may find ourselves halfway through the story, the story began with, in the beginning, God created, and it will end someday in victory. And so the ending's been written, and we find ourselves here in this middle space. And so we can look forward, like Paul and Silas do, that the right things to do might not be to try to change the story, but instead to be on the journey of the story and to be faithful as we walk through it. Paul and Silas don't seem to view prison as something that demonstrates the absence of God. They actually seem to know that God is near, even when they're in prison. And so, because of his, it seems, his felt proximity, they sing and they pray. And they keep acting with integrity, even radical integrity, as we're about to read, in God's time. And because of that, the life of the jailer and his family are changed forever. And they end up released anyway. So this is Acts 16, verses 25 to 34. Let's read together. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Think about that. I wonder what they thought. Oh, Silas, good tenor voice there, you know? I mean, what were they thinking? Um, but they were listening. Maybe it brought them some comfort. Maybe the gospel was being preached through their songs, as we'll see in a second. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. Everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling in fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. 
and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then he brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire household that he believed in God. Okay. So just to re- recap. Everybody's listening to them sing their songs. Then there's a big earthquake. All the shackles come off. The guard thinks, well, okay, all, everybody's gone now. So he knows what's going to happen to him if he lets the prisoners escape. He'll be killed. Tortured first, then killed. So he decides, I'm just going to do it for him. He draws his sword to kill himself. Paul says, don't do it. Don't do it. We're all still here. Imagine a prison where all the cell doors open and everyone stayed put. I could interview 100 prison guards at San Quentin, ask them, what are the chances of that happening? (laughs) Well, maybe we go to Rikers Island. I bet they'd all stay put. What in the world happens here? Well, I don't know 100%, sure, but here's my best guess. I think there's reason to support it. I think it's something about the singing and the praying of Paul and Silas, as it says they're listening to them, begins to get through, and that's why, even to the, to the jailer himself, So that when it does open, Paul and Silas remaining in their cell causes the others to be influenced by it in that particular way, to stay put. I mean, look, God had Paul and Silas, for whatever reason, right where he wanted them. And it was him shining through them in prison that led to the salvation of the Philippian jailer and his family. I mean, it's later on, uh, Paul will write a, a letter to the church that's formed at Philippi, largely through this particular incident, And he'll say, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Don't be anxious about anything. To live is Christ. To die is gain. And I got to think that when that letter is read to the church at Philippi, the jailer's sitting on the back row, or maybe he's in front, maybe he's working on the security team. Who knows, right? And he's sitting there going, yep, that's right. That's exactly right. I mean, isn't it staggering what you read here? I mean, it's amazing. It's breathtaking. I mean, we're right to lament the suffering of the righteous at the hands of the wicked, to ask, you know, as David does in the Psalms, you know, how long, Lord, is this going to go on? However, there is another way to go with this, right, which is to sing and pray and to wait, wait for the earthquake. And to continue to act with integrity even when we don't have to do that. The first Sunday of November, that'll be next Sunday. We are in October, as I've learned, so it'd be November. Um, The first Sunday of November is the National Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. Now, here in America, that kind of comes and goes, and nobody pays any attention to it because there's very little of that here in our society. We don't have as much of the, the more, we'll say, the, the grand persecution of people, people being thrown in jail all the time, people being uh, murdered or killed or something like that for, the, for their faith. Um, but it has not been lost on me. Since him and I took that summer and went to Bangkok, Thailand, it has not been lost on me. We lived in a, in a, uh, in a big house with people who had been disowned by their parents for becoming Christians. And one of the primary ministries of the church there was a prison visitation ministry, but it wasn't to just go visit the murderers and everything. It was also to visit the Christians who were in jail for being Christians. So they would send them to Laos and Burma and Cambodia and all these places where people had been thrown in jail just for simply being, being Christians. And I thought to myself, boy, it's like we live on two planets almost. Like, like over there, there's one reality, and, and here we've got a different reality. And we have our own challenges. I'm not saying there are none. But it does feel like they're playing big league ball, and, and, and we're kind of, uh, I don't know, we're playing in the fantasy league or something. Like, yeah, we're playing the same game in our own way, but in reality, that's a whole nother, that's a, just an entirely different ball game. And when we talk about martyrs, if you will, um, you know, martyr just means witness in Greek. And the way they've been described historically is you have dry martyrs, that would be like us here today, people who are witnesses that don't have to shed blood. And then you have wet martyrs, people who shed blood for the sake of Jesus. And those folks, the wet martyrs, if you will, 
Tertullian, the second century, says, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And it's his way of saying that somehow, in his way, God would use the persecution of the church to spread the gospel. It happened, we already seen it in, in the stoning of Stephen and how that leads to a great persecution that spreads the church throughout the, the world. And then, you know, beginning at Antioch and so forth, as we've talked here in Acts. But when we take communion a little bit later on in this service, it's poignant sometimes to remember that we need to be praying and, and, and to identify ourselves with our brothers and sisters who are suffering in other places um, for, for what they believe. You know, I think God may call some of us to be martyrs someday. I, mean, I hope that's not the case-ish, I guess. I don't, you know, is it, should we desire that? Should we not desire that? Or whatever is, is, is a bigger discussion. But for most of us, our call is going to be dry martyrdom. That means to bear testimony to the joy of the gospel right where we're at in the midst of the daily challenges and the contradictions and the temptations and the adversities which come with uh, as we follow the Lord on a daily basis. But um, I, thought, I thought to myself, like, I wonder how we would do if we just, like today, all of a sudden, something happened and we ended up going through a massive persecution. I mean a massive one. Uh, threats, uh, imprisonment. You know, how would we do how would we interpret that? Um, would we sing? Would we pray? Uh, would we just file lawsuits? Would we gripe about it on social media? What would we do? I mean, Christians, in my experience, working in ministry for 25 plus years, me in the church my whole life, range from the absolute battle-tested, rugged warriors of God on one side, to the people who think that when the Bible talks about tribulation, it's talking about their favorite Netflix show being delayed another month. That's their thing. Like, it's like everything that happens is serious and a trial and a tribulation and dramatic, traumatic for them. I think the Bible on whole, if you look at it from Genesis all the way through, the reason it talks as often as it does about suffering, about perseverance, about long-suffering, is because the expectation is you're going to endure those things as part of your life. If you're living out your faith the way that you should, it should be, what's the word I'm looking like tough. There should be something that requires actual spiritual resources from you. And if it's not happening, you can give thanks to God for, for giving you a time of peace. But at the same time, the question is, are, what are you doing that would make you meet such little resistance from Satan? Are you not sharing your faith at all? Uh, are you doing things that Satan is so cozy with, why would he oppose you? What is it that you're living for? Um, I think one of the things that as I look at Paul and Silas and I marvel at them, by the time again that Paul gets here, he's already endured a ton. So it makes me think that the toughness that Paul and Silas have here, which is not, again, it doesn't come across as this rugged, uh, you know, uh, tobacco chewing, spur wearing kind of toughness. It's not that. It's more of an inner, an inner peace and an inner strength and a confidence that comes from knowing that God is with you and that the victory is going to be yours, whether it's now or in the life to come. To live is Christ, to die is gain. doesn't matter. I'm with Jesus if I'm here, and I'm even closer to him someday when I'm with him eternally. So whatever happens to me, whatever. That kind of confidence, right? But it's also, you can see from what Acts has already told us, they're, they've done a lot of hard things already. So by the time they get to prison, they're not rookies. I mean, these guys have already, Paul particularly, gee whiz, he's been beaten to a pulp already. He's been literally shipwrecked, stoned to death, half to death. They thought he was dead. They left him bloody in a pile on the outside of, of the city. So by the time they get to jail, I know this sounds weird, but it's almost like Tuesday for them. You just go, dude. I don't know what they got, but I want it. I want to know 
that I am ready for whatever this life can bring. I want to know and I want to testify that the gospel that I preach is powerful, is being demonstrated powerfully in my life. I want to, I want to be able to survive whatever comes my way without having to go, uh, you know, every single little brittle thing creates a spiritual crisis of biblical proportions for me. But to walk in the kind of confidence and power of God, that causes Paul to turn around and tell the spirit inside that girl and say, get out of her. He finds it annoying. Whereas like we watch horror movies about it and run away, you know, have nightmares about it. Paul's like, no man, in the name of Jesus, get out of her. And so out it goes. And then here, instead of doing what they, uh, what's supposed to, I guess, uh, what they're supposed to do, which is cower in the face of Rome, they're singing and they're praying. And when the great earthquake comes, they don't run because they know freedom is theirs anyway. Wow. Doing little hard things prepares you to do big hard things. Um. I'm an avid hiker. I took a few weeks off, decided to go hiking again. Okay? I feel like somebody has taken a sledgehammer to my feet all right, because I don't have hiker's feet anymore. Hiker's feet. Stuff that can climb on rocks and doesn't really hurt your feet anymore. I'm getting old. That's another part of it. But the other part is there is a discipline to doing it. If you're going to do any kind of real hiking, you've got to get your feet ready. Uh, so a lot of people will walk, you know, short stretches, you know, a mile or so. But if you go three and a half, four miles, even just right out of the chute without your feet being ready, you will know. When you sit down and you say you put your feet up for an hour or two and you decide, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get a Coke out of the fridge. When you stand up, you are going to know. You are going to scream. You are going to go, oh, because your, your feet in very small ways. Some people, it's on the sand at the beach. You know, you haven't been on the beach in forever, and your, your feet are kind of subtly clawing the sand to give you traction. And then later on, you go like, like, I didn't know I had muscles in my toes. Like, look at that. That hurts. Well, hikers' feet, man, when you, when you got a good set of feet on you, you can hike on rock piles for hours. You ever see one of these extreme deals like on Netflix, the guy who, who like scales the side of El Capitan, and he's got his toes like clawing this half-inch ledge on the side? You're like, dude, I couldn't even <laughs> walk into the refrigerator hurts my feet. How does this guy do this? Well, he trained for it. You know, it's, it's learning how to do small stuff that's hard. I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then you do it, and guess what? Your feet get a little tougher as a result of that. You learn, I don't have to let the way I feel determine how I live. Let me say that again. You don't have to let how you feel determine how you live. Let the one who saved you, let the Holy Spirit determine how you live and bring your emotions and what you want under submission to the Holy Spirit. That's the disciple's life. Tough feet that come about by walking daily in the footsteps of the Savior. You want to know why your gums bleed when you brush your teeth? Because they aren't tough. You haven't brushed them very much. Shame on you. What would your mother say? I'm just kidding. But I mean, you brush your teeth and, the, and they start to bleed because they're not ready for that. You know, and I just wonder, I, I wonder if, how I put this, I'm going to preach to the choir for a second, but like you get to a point where it's like if a person can't bring themselves to say no uh, to, to some little minor desire they have or get out of bed at the crack of 11 on Sunday, to come to church, what are they going to do if they ever go to prison? I mean, you know, there's no, well, they won't go to prison. You know why? Because their life is going to be lived in such a way as to avoid prison, because they know they can't handle prison. See what I'm saying? So, so then what we have is we end up with people standing back being really critical of the church for what it is and isn't doing, and they're usually the softest people in the room. Their feet are the softest. Their gums bleed like crazy. But these folks, Paul and Silas, whoo, like the guy in our episode last week was left dead outside the city. And they prayed for him and he got up. Where does he go next? Jail. 
He goes to jail. And what does he do there? Well, if there was a God, why would all this be happening? I mean, no. He sings, he prays, and then the earthquake happens, his cell door goes open, and you know what he does? He converts the jailer. Woo! That's the way I want to live. I don't want to live like in some sort of weird, all I do is get up every morning trying to figure out how do I avoid any pain. You ever shaken hands with a real construction worker? I mean, a real one. You'll know because your knuckles crunch when they shake your hand. It doesn't matter how tough you think you're being. You know why? Their hands are strong and they're tough. When they hit their hand with a nail, they hardly even, or with a hammer, they barely even notice. It's like, ah, man. You know, whereas like for me, it's like, oh, urgent care, you know, or whatever. It's like, that's tough hands, tough feet, tough heart and soul. That's what I see in Paul and Silas. Now, it's not loud. It's not boisterous. But man, do they teach me that doing hard things, little hard things, they get you those kind of feet. We do small hard things so we can do big hard things. And it's those little acts of discipleship along the way. Not saying, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to go. I don't want to be there. I don't want to give. I don't want to serve. I don't want to whatever, okay? What you ought to want to is to want to know Christ and the power of his rising. And to share in his suffering and to conform to his death. That is what you say you want to do when you go to the baptistry. You say, I want it all. I want to know, as Paul said, I want to know Christ and the power of his rising. I want to share in his sufferings, conform to his death. I want it all. I want to be like Christ, and I want to know him in every way I can. And yes, Jesus is now risen. He is sitting at the right hand of God, but there was a journey before he got there, and it led to the cross. And as we read in our text last week, God, he left us an example as, that we should follow in his steps. Rodney Stark, the famous church historian, teaches at Baylor. I think he's still at Baylor. Uh, he notes that there were at least two great plagues in the first three centuries of the church. Uh, you had one in 160 and one in 250 that were really major, major um, uh, plagues. And when I say plagues, it's like 5,000 people a day are dying in a, in, when the population is kind of sparse and, and spread out. Um, but he talks in, in a particular book of his, he quotes Dionysius, who's a bishop of Alexandria at the time, and he talks about how during that season, they, um, everybody pretty much bolted the city to get away from the disease except the Christians who went into the city, and they died by the thousands helping the sick that were, were sick inside the city. And he talks about how powerful of a witness that was to the people around. See, sometimes, you know, cursing the darkness rather than shining through it does not necessarily make a better witness. But that being willing to stand with serious integrity, solid integrity, okay, that might be a greater testimony then you can even ever just speak with your mouth. Because your life is already saying things about Jesus before you do open your mouth. Now, don't get me wrong, we need to say, we need to teach too, okay? But teaching without a life that backs up what's being said is, is empty words, really. What, what people need to see, it's not, Paul and Silas, if, if they weren't walking it out, and if those cell doors open and they bolt, And everything they had prayed and sung out loud, everybody heard, might have just been looked at as, okay, see, they were just a bunch of other criminals, and that was just their little little thing that they do, I guess. Try and convince everybody they're really good guys. It was a bit. It was a little, little deal, but they can't say that. Paul and Silas stay put. They stay right there. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate things. And if the church, meaning us, uh, and, and, and anybody like us that's, that's committed their lives to Jesus, if we would do, go about living holy, simple, 
courageous lives, we might be shocked at how loudly those sermons preached. Now, if it's words and no life, then you have empty words. You can't just live and hope that by osmosis they come to know Jesus. It's both. But what I see in Paul, Paul's life is when he, by, by the point that Philippians is written, um, you know, to basically all this happens at Philippi, and then Philippians comes probably sometime later, that you look at it and you go, I bet everybody there that was part of that church, they knew about the big earthquake. They knew what Paul and Silas had done. The jailer was there to tell them. You want to know what these guys did? They were in Roman prison, and not only did they stay put, somehow they got everybody else to stay put. There's something going on with those dudes. Like they, whatever they got, and that's what the Philippian jailer seems to want. He's like, what must I do to be saved? That's the question out of his mouth when he sees everybody still in their cell. I mean, it's incredible. And I think sometimes we overcomplicate things that, that, that maybe at least it starts with, okay? The first journey is living a life of integrity, living a life that substantiates the claims that are made. Hey, come to Jesus. It'll change your life. Great. Show me it's changed yours. Show me how it's changed you. That doesn't mean you got to be perfect, but you're aspiring to live righteously, and the spirit that God has put in you is, is obvious and palpable. The one that isn't a spirit of fear, but one of, of power, love, and self-discipline. There's a story of the Mensa organization, which is this alleged group of geniuses. You know, everybody has to have an IQ over 140, I think it is. They, went, they were having some gathering, and their, their waiters and waitresses were, having a, were kind of having a time. The salt and pepper shakers, you guys remember those when we had salt and pepper shakers? Uh, instead of little paper packets that you get now. Uh, salt and pepper shakers and came out, but they realized the salt was in the pepper shaker. The Mensas did. Pepper was in the salt shaker. So they thought, oh, okay, how are we going to get this out? How can we get this out and swap this out without uh, needing assistance? So they sat there and they created a brilliant solution. It involved a saucer, a straw, some other things in order to do it. They, they tell the, the staff to come over because they're very impressed with themselves. The waitress comes over and, and they go, hey, listen, the salt is in the pepper shaker and the pepper is in the salt shaker. And she goes, oh, sorry. She just screws the lid off of one and screws it off the other and just switches the lids. And they were sitting there like, yeah, that's what, that was our idea too, you know? <laughs> you know, churches, I think, I think we get too caught up in our own little strategies and our own techniques and our own little things sometimes where it's like, you know, we, we've got to get back to that idea. What you see in Paul and Silas, when you face tribulation, prayer, song, worship, faithfulness, that that is where the kingdom of God has its root, and that's really the foundation of it. Our integrity is absolutely vital to our witness. If, if, if we're the kind of people that bolt when the cell door is cracked, when the money is left improperly guarded, the kind of people who will shave income on their tax returns, return evil for evil, act hatefully toward opponents, things like that, it's the integrity of what Paul and Silas do that preserves the jailer's life and persuades him to be saved. And we need to remember that being like Jesus may be more important than anything we have to say about him. Or better said, our lives are already saying a lot about him before our mouths even start moving. So we must also be holy for the sake of the world and have integrity for the sake of the world. And all the while, while we go through this particular tribulation that we're in, because in a certain way, we're all still a little bit in this prison that we're in called earth. And so while we're here, we need to continue to sing and pray and not stop singing, regardless of what the guards think. Just keep, keep singing, keep praying. When the time's right, the earthquake will come, and we're going to go free. And until then, let's sing and pray. And let's do it with our sisters and brothers all around the globe, whether they're suffering today or whether they're... Um, they're out there um, preaching the gospel today. May God bless the hearing of his word. We're, gonna, we're going to uh, now take the Lord's Supper. We have some elements. If you missed it on your way in, a uh, little bread and cup and baggies to uh, keep everybody uh, sanitized here. So if you'd like one, just put your hand in the air. We'll bring you one.
But as we do, the, the role model for Paul and Silas was Jesus himself, who, you know, goes all the way to the cross in his obedience and was set free from, from this life via the empty tomb and is now seated at the right hand of God, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. So today, if you're brokenhearted, lacking in courage or whatever, let's pray together that God would supply it and that God would give us a song to sing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, with bread and cup now, we say thank you for the example of Jesus. We say thank you for giving us a song to sing, for giving us the ability to sing even while we're in jail. So, Father, the next time we're in jail, give us the courage and the witness to sing. Help us to live lives of integrity. Help us, Father, to know um, that it's in the daily walk of discipleship that we develop the heart, the tough feet, Father, the strong gums of the faith, uh, so that, Father, when the big trials come, we'll be ready and we'll stand strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. So now, Father, as we remember Jesus, the body and blood of Jesus, we remember his faithfulness and we aspire to it, Father. The example that he set for us in strength courage, even unto death on the cross. We pray this now in his name. Amen.